We'll probably get started. People will join in. Um, <clears throat> Is usually the audience from the US? No, it's from everywhere. So today I can see Vittorio just joined from, uh, not Vittorio, I'm sorry, Satya just joined from Paris. Uh, you, have, you have certainly pretty much six, six or seven countries right away. I can oh. see. Uh, almost all of these people who are our friends join regularly. And it's the birthday of one of them who is joining from India. Uh, Krishna Mohan, who was my former postdoc, is retired now. Uh, oh, no, I guess he's Satya. Hi, Satya. Yeah, he, he's around. So he just joined. We should, meet, we should meet sometime in Paris. Yeah, Sat Satya is out there itself, right? Yes. Okay, let me introduce. I, I cannot uh, hear you, Satya, but like. <laughs> he's, he's, he's muted, I think. Yeah, he's muted, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. So I said that uh, I didn't know that you were in Paris. Otherwise, anyway, in any case, we are, it is difficult to meet these days. <laughs> yes, 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 definitely. But perhaps, I mean, in the fall, I mean, it would be, it would be easier. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll send you a message and perhaps we can, we can meet. Yeah, yeah, definitely, please. <laughs> be great. Okay. All right, let me get started in introducing uh, Vittorio. It, it's a pleasure to welcome Vittorio Loreto, uh, exploring the adjacent possible play, anticipation, surprise. That's the title of his talk. Uh, Vittorio joins us from Rome right now. He's at the Sapienza University in Rome. He's also at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. And he's the director of the Sony Computer Science Lab in Paris. Uh, Let's mute ourselves in case you are not muted. Uh, please do mute yourself uh, for now at least. Um, and uh, here is a brief bio. Victorio is currently a full professor of physics at Complexity Systems, Physics of Complexity Systems, Complex Systems at Sapiens University since 2016. And the faculty, as I said, is the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. He is also presently directing the Sony Computer Science Lab in Paris where he leads the team of innovation, creativity, and artificial intelligence. Vittorio finished his undergraduate studies in 1990 and obtained his PhD in 1995, uh, both from uh, Roma Sapienza. He worked with uh, Professor Pierre Tunero for his PhD. He did postdoctoral work in Naples and in Paris with Hans Hermann, when I think I first uh, interacted with him, of course, remotely. Uh, his scientific activity is mainly focused on the statistical physics of complex systems and its interdisciplinary applications. He coordinated several projects at the EU and Italian levels. More recently, he coordinated the Templeton funded Crayon project devoted to unfolding the dynamics of innovation and creativity. Uh, Vittorio has published over 180 papers in internationally refereed journals and, and conference proceedings and chaired several workshops and conferences. He's a member of the executive committee of the Complex System Society. Actually, it's, uh, this is a very short uh, intro to Vittorio, but we shouldn't take up more of his time. So with that, it's all yours, my friend, and welcome. Thanks, Rajit. Thanks a lot uh, for, uh, for this kind of introduction, but also for the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, it was long overdue, and. Thanks to all of you for being for being with us today. So, uh, so Surajit told me this would be very very formal. So please, I mean, interrupt me. I mean, whenever you think I mean there is something to say or or ask. Uh, so the, the main keyword of today would be would be adjacent possible. Probably you heard already this word. This is originally due uh, to Stuart Kaufman. Uh, when he was at Santa Fe Institute. And of course he was thinking about biology and the way in which nature, I mean, evolves. Uh, somehow think that nature does not make large leaps or jumps, try to uh, optimize and reuse the materials in general. It could be ideas, technology, which are already there, okay? So he came up with this idea, which had no, I mean, a mathematical foundation till a few years back. So that's why we got, we got somehow interested in this, I mean, in connection to, 
let's say innovation processes, but of course, I mean, innovation here will not be in the, in the sense of uh, technology, but more in, in the sense of novelty. So the experience of the new for, for everyone. That's why, I mean, the subtitle is play anticipation and surprise, because it's really, I mean, about the experience we all have about something new so um if you if you if you uh, agree i mean i like to spend i mean two minutes i mean playing a little game okay why is not okay so this is a shannon game i mean proposed by claude shannon in the in the in the 50s uh, it's a game i mean supposed to to be there to to measure the the complexity of our language but in general the complexity of any uh, sequence of characters so uh, if you agree, I would ask you to, to switch on your mic uh, because I mean, the, the game would be like this. So we will start with a, little, with a little text like this one. People as a rule will not stop to realize and there is a space, okay? And the, the only rule of the game is, to, okay, okay. The, the, the aim of the game is to reconstruct what follows. So the remaining of the text, okay? But the only rule is that you can only ask questions like, is the next character a Z or a B? Okay. And I can reply yes or no. This could be a question with the binary answer. I mean, just to be clear, you cannot ask, is the next word uh, uh, an adjective or is the next word, I don't know, a zinga, something like this. So you cannot ask this. You can only ask, is the next character a specific character? So uh, it's not dangerous is for free, so we, we'll, we'll go on for one, one minute. I mean, no more, but just to give you the feeling of what, what is this game. So people as a rule will not stop to realize space. That? It's not a word, it should be a character. Oh, T. No. Hey. I guess no, but uh, I, I didn't hear. Uh, w. W, yes. <laughs> H. H. <laughs> A. A. Now um. you go, Avalanche. What is the next one? T. T. E. E. Okay. And then? A space, I guess. Space. I. No. <laughs> what? D. No. W. No. I. Yes. Oh, no, I. Sorry, it was A. Sorry, it was A. A was already there. Okay. <laughs> y. No. Space. Space. N. No. G. No, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little help, but you know, the help will be important. Okay. You know, I mean, uh, oh, oh, oh. no. I. No. H. R. No. E. R. E. No. No. R. No. Hmm. O. No. Hmm. H. No. no. H is not there. He ruled it out. Perhaps I miss that you said it already, but uh, okay. In order not to waste time, was it A. Oh. I don't know if anyone said this. Okay, the last one, and then we stop. Yes. S, yes. K. K, yes. Space, then. Space. <laughs> yes. And then, and so on and so forth, okay. Then you go on. So just a little remark, I mean, this text was due to write, actually, this is the intro to this novel, Gatsby. Okay. which is a specific novel because it is a lipogram. I mean, it's a, it's a novel entirely without the letter E. This is an introduction in which he explains how this army of letter C was sort of pushing to, to enter the, the, the novel, but they couldn't. 
Okay, so of course, I mean, this was a little bit complicated for this, but you see, I mean, the point is you're actually exploiting your knowledge of language in order to, to guess, I mean, what is next. And at each, at each point, uh, you have a certain number of possible directions or possible hypotheses. The more the hypotheses are, I mean, the largest would be the surprise for you. Actually, this is one uh, table in the, in the famous uh, uh, Shannon paper. Actually, there is a correspondence between the, each character and the digit. You see the digit is actually the number of attempts uh, spent by actual players in guessing the specific characters. And you see, you go from, to, from one to numbers like 17 or 15 for reverse R and V. So you see, I mean, it's very, very staggered. I mean, the, the way in which you, you guess this. Uh, once you understand, I mean, what is the word like in the case of what, okay, of course you get an avalanche of successes, but then at some point you get stuck. And in principle, I mean, after a full stop or a comma, I actually you have a very hard time understanding what could be there. Even though actually the text is there, I mean, it's written with normal characters. There are no invented characters. So the aim of this game was to measure the complexity of, in this specific case, was language uh, as a measure of the surprise experienced by, by people during the, during the game. Actually, the, the estimation uh, given by Shannon was uh, around one bit per character. Actually, he gave uh, an upper bound and the lower bound. The upper bound was more or less 1.3 bits per character and the lower bound 0 0.6. So on average, it's one bit per character, which means Actually, uh, language is very redundant because typically now we use eight bits per character to encode uh, each character. And of course, the actual information is around one, more or less, because of course, this is something which is not, uh, is not computable, I mean, rigorously, but still, okay, you can have, a, you can have an estimate. And just to give you an idea, this is the, is the, is the success rate versus prior knowledge. So on the, 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 the top row is the number of characters you have already seen. Okay, on the, on the y-axis, actually, you have the number of attempts. So, for instance, the, the number circled in red means you have 19% chances of guessing the, uh, the second attempt after you have seen six characters. And you see there is a sort of diagonal here. So the numbers are moving, I mean, upward if you move, I mean, to the right. So the more you know the text, and the less, uh, uh, the less attempts you need uh, in order to guess the right character. But of course, this table is important because based on this, you can actually compute the, 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 the conditional probability. So actually the, the actual element used by Shannon was the probability that given n minus one character, so i1, i n minus one, what is the probability that the next character would be, would be j. So while playing, actually, it was, uh, it was collecting all this, uh, so compiling this uh, conditional probabilities. And based on this, he computed the, the, the estimate of the entropy. So basically what you do is you, you compute this Q1 of N. So I guess you can see my, my, my pointer, which is actually the sum of uh, uh, all the probabilities, okay, over all the possible N minus one, long, so n minus one gram, so all the, the, the sequences of n minus one, uh, with a j star, j star is the, the, the character that maximizes the probability for that particular n gram, okay? And so basically q1 of n is the estimate of the probability to guess correctly at, after the first attempt, okay? And then of course you can compute q2, uh, q2 uh, of n, q3, Q4, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if you, if you compute minus the sum of all the possible characters of QI, log QI, this is the estimate that Shannon gave for this. And this is the upper estimate. So the, 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 the lower estimate, the lower bound is a little bit more intricate. It was, I mean, it was given 0 0.6, but the, the, the upper estimate was around 1.3 bit per character. If you like the game, I mean, actually, there is this implementation of the game. This is a, is a new edition of the game. Uh, you can play in several languages. Uh, and more than this, you can actually play against a friend. Okay? Or uh, uh, probably it's even more fun. You can actually play against uh, an artificial intelligence. Okay? So at the end, I mean, 
you see, I mean, whether you, you, you got, I mean, more successful than, uh, than a machine playing more or less the same game, which is a very interesting ca case because uh, uh, probably I'll say something, about, say something about this later, but of course, I mean, predicting the future for machines is very complicated, especially for novelties. Uh, because of course, I mean, they have a training phase and if there is something appearing that never appeared before, I mean, they could be in big trouble as we do. Uh, okay, this is, uh, okay, so the, the, the key point about, I mean, what I wanted to say today is the notion of new, okay, and of course, I mean, the new means so many different things, I mean, because the new can be, can be new for a single person, so for each of us, like, I mean, we discover a new song or a new book, a new person, et cetera, et cetera, but of course, I mean, if I'm the author of a new song, then of course, this is a, not a novelty for me, but in principle, it can be a novelty for many different people. Of course, I mean, I, I would expect that my paper would be read by millions of people, which is never the case, but still, I mean, in principle, this could be a universal, a universal novelty. So whenever, of course, I mean, innovation is, is everywhere. I don't need to, to tell you from biology to technology to social systems, of course, science, but also, also arts and architecture. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the typical journey for, uh, for a novelty or for an innovation is very complex because uh, on, the, on the left, actually you have uh, the, the possible mechanisms to, to create seeds, okay? Uh, a lot of them are basically biologically inspired like mutation, uh, trial and error, but also acceptation. But then there are other things like tinkering or serendipity, I mean, whose, uh, whose overlap, of course, I mean, is non is non zero. But all these are sort of uh, pathways to get to the seed of a possible novelty. But this is just the beginning of a journey because then, of course, I mean, this novelty uh, can actually diffuse, can actually propagate, can get successful. Uh, sometimes, and this is something we, we typically want when we publish a paper, we want to be ahead of time, okay? And of course we want to be before someone else because the case of multiples is always there. So people working at the same time, perhaps independently on the same, on the same subject. Uh, perhaps, I mean, more importantly, whenever we, we discuss about novelties, and I guess this will be crucial from the remaining of the, of the lecture. So we are always playing at the interface between two spaces. So Francois Jacob actually would say uh, two spaces which are the actual. So the actual is the set of things uh, one person or a given system experienced already in the past. So something already known and experienced and the possible, which is the, the set of things you can clearly possibly uh, experience in the next or in the, in the, in the far future. Uh, and of course, I mean, this space is, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, nobody knows, I mean, what is the structure of this, of this space, but of course, I mean, this can be a physical space. So for instance, uh, a possible space could be Machu Picchu to visit if you never visit it or any other place. I mean, you can possibly think about visiting, but you never, you never did. Could be a conceptual space. And of course, I mean, whenever we have uh, a conceptual or intellectual achievements, we are exploring, I mean, the, the space of possibilities here. Also when we learn, which is a very interesting activity in which we try to make sense of a set of new, or new, 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 new information, and and of course could be a biological biological space. Uh, and of course, I mean now we, we are I mean coexisting with COVID, and we know how much uh, there is this sort of uh, cat and mouse uh, uh, race between virus and uh, and the immune system with variants and all this kind of stuff. Of course, viruses are exploring their adjacent possible or somehow the space of the space of possibilities. So of course, I mean, this is uh, in, in theory, I mean, in practice, actually, this space, these spaces are very difficult to grasp, because of course, we can, uh, we can guess uh, a set of possibilities, but I'm pretty sure we cannot guess all of them, right? Okay, so this is very, very, very complex. So there are things you cannot even conceive before, before, before you get there, before you see the actual possibility. And this, of course, I mean, it's a, it's a problem because of course, I mean, whenever we want to, to look at the future, the only strategy we are left with is the one of looking at the future with the eyes of the past. Okay, so we try, this is what, I mean, we do is what also machines do. 
So we try to compile, I mean, databases of past experiences, and we try to learn from the past. And also perhaps, I mean, trying to construct models, okay, and then project this model into the future. But of course, this can be, this can be misleading. And if you think about all the attempts to make weather forecasts, you understand that uh, only looking at, uh, at past records didn't work. Okay, so the, 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 the method of the analogs. So the idea of looking at the past for a similar sequence to the sequence I'm observing right now, I mean, didn't work actually, because the idea was, okay, I look at the future of that past, which is very similar to my present. And I hope that the future, my future now will be similar to the future of that past. But since, for instance, for weather forecast, the, the, the complexity of the, of the embedding system is so high, actually, you never have the experience of enough uh, sequences in the past to be able to make predictions. I guess there is only one example in which this works, which is the, the, the tidal waves prediction, because in the case of tides, the complexity is much smaller than for weather forecast. And in this case, looking at the past seems to be a good strategy. But in all the other cases, we basically develop modeling scheme. We run these model, modeling schemes. Uh, possibly data driven okay and then we make this uh, this uh, this forecast activity uh, it's funny i mean because uh, i discovered i mean this this uh, this article on the guardians in july 2017 these are self driving cars of volvo uh, being fooled by by kangaroos in uh, in the, in australia because of course i mean volvo is is swedish and uh, i can imagine that the animals i mean uh, I mean, used for training where, I don't know, elks, caribous, bears, I don't know, but definitely not kangaroos. And the cars simply were stuck, okay? So, of course, I mean, you can teach a machine, I mean, what a kangaroo is, but then, of course, there will be the next kangaroo, okay? So, you have to make sure that the machine is able to, to, to foresee also what is not in the, in the training phase. Okay, so a little bit about the statistics before moving to modeling this kind of phenomena, just to see, I mean, what would be the, the stylized facts? Are a few of them, actually, there are many of them, but I just focus on a few of them. So the first one is a zip slow, which I guess is very well known to everyone. So I'll go fast on this. This is go to, it's due to zip, uh, but actually even before this, a stoop in, in France actually observed more or less the same kind of behavior. And the idea is this one. So you look at the text and you, you focus on a specific uh, word, in this case is language, and then you simply count the, the number of occurrences of this word. You do this for all the possible uh, words, okay? And you compute the frequency of words versus the rank. So you rank all the frequencies, and then you basically plot like uh, Zips did, the, on the x-axis the rank, Okay, on the y-axis, the frequency, and you observe, this is in text, one was Joyce and the other one was Eldridge, a power law behavior with exponent close, very close to one. And after that, actually, Zip's law has been observed in hundreds of different systems with different cutoffs, of course, the different deviations with respect to the original Zip's uh, uh, exponent, but still, I mean, now a large, uh, a large distribution, a power law like distribution is still considered to be a Zips, a Zips law. Actually, if you focus now on, on larger uh, data sets like uh, the Gutenberg project, you see that actually you recover the Zips law only at the beginning, okay? And actually, I mean, for very small ranks, so very high frequencies, you have a sort of flattening, okay? For, for this, but then if you if you look at um, small frequencies, so high ranks, you see that the exponent, the curve is bending and the exponent, uh, I mean, is much higher, if any, okay? So it's more than, it's more than double. And this is a similar situation for many other different systems. So it's not always close to one, but there are, I mean, tails. At this point of the tail is very, is very important. It will become important in a, in, a, in a second. The second important law, I mean, probably even more important for, for innovation processes is the Ips law. Again, I mean, there was someone else before Ips in 1978 who looked at this law. And, uh, and the idea of this law is the following. So let's consider again the same text. Okay, but now what I do is uh, I, I, I scan through the text, okay? And I count one every time there is a word appearing for the first time. Okay, so all the words you read now 
are the words that at the moment of appearance uh, were actually at their first appearance. Okay, and so what I can do now, I can actually count as a function of time. So time now is the number of words scanned, the number of distinct words. Okay, and then I can plot d of n as a function of n. Okay, so this is what you get for the same database we we used before. So the Gutenberg uh, project we use for the for the deep slow. You see at the beginning the the this is a log log plot. At the beginning the the behavior is linear. So at the beginning almost all words are new. But then at some point you get a bending. Okay, but it's not a bending exponential. Okay, there is no exponential saturation like I mean you have a sort of polya hern. You extract balls one after the other, okay. And then at some point you run out of balls and you get a saturation. So in this case, you get a, a power law like behavior with an exponent smaller than uh, than one. At least in this uh, in this definition of time, which is one word, one instance of time, okay. And in this case, specific case of text, uh, the, the growth is uh, is close to square root or square root of n, which means that actually if you if you take the derivative which means the probability, I mean, estimating the probability for an innovation, actually you get a decrease of this curve as a function of n, like one over square root of n, which means that the rate of innovation is not constant, otherwise this would be a flat line, but it's decreasing over time, okay? So I'm just saying this because, I mean, whatever model we want to come up with to explain this kind of phenomenology, we should be able to, to reproduce at least these two rows, actually much more than this. Of course, there is a link between the zips and the ips law, uh, very, very simply. So suppose now the sequence of uh, uh, events is now, I mean, the sequence of uh, color balls, okay, with different colors. So you see the black spots are there to mark uh, the colors appearing for the first time, okay. And uh, now you want to focus on the, on the last novelty, so the, the green ball, okay. Of course, I mean, it's just appeared, so its frequency of occurrence is one, and uh, and this absolute frequency will be one over n because you extracted n n volts, okay, and uh, and of course, I mean, d is the index, so it will be the maximum uh, the maximum uh, rank, okay. Uh, now we want to link actually the zips law and in particular the exponent of the zips law to the exponent of the ips law and we do this in this way so on the on the left you have the ips law so f of r uh, okay depending on the value of alpha actually you have different normalizations so it's always r to the minus alpha except for the for the for the case uh, for the case alpha equal to 1 in which you have a logarithmic correction um, so the point is now you want to focus on r equal to d, okay? So what I do sure. is, is f of d will be alpha minus one d to the minus alpha. And this probability I put equal to one over n, okay? And then I invert, basically I express d as a function of n. Of course, I can do this for all the three cases, alpha larger than one, smaller than one, and alpha equal to one. And what I get is this, actually, that d will be proportional to n to the gamma, okay, to an exponent gamma. And in this specific case, for this case, gamma is one over alpha, okay? Of course, this is for alpha larger than one, okay? For alpha equal to one, you have a logarithmic correction. And for alpha smaller than one, the growth is always, uh, is always, uh, is always linear. So it's interesting because it seems that you actually, you can have uh, uh, this kind of uh, relation between the exponent of the zips law, so the alpha, and the exponent of the ips law. So gamma again, the ips law is telling you how, how fast is innovation in the system, while alpha is just telling you about the overall statistics of the, of the system. Um, but one important point is typically, I mean, if you look at empirical data, this relation only holds on the tails, okay? And uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember, I mean, we had, uh, okay, I can show you later on, okay, here. I had to move this because, okay, let's see whether this is better, okay. Uh, so you remember, I mean, the exponent for the Gutenberg was around two point something, and the exponent for the Ips, I mean, top here was 0.5, more or less, which is more or less, I mean, the inverse of, of two point something. Um, but the point is, it's always like this. Actually, it's not always, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, because the point is actually this link between gamma and alpha is only holds if you suppose, I mean, you have uh, a zips law, 
and then you randomly extract poles with the distribution which is given by the, 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 the deep slope, right? Okay. And in this case, you would get, I mean, an epsilon with an exponent gamma equal to one over alpha, okay? But I mean, not in no, in no systems, I would say, I mean, there is this uh, sort of random samplings from a pure zip slow, okay? So in many cases, the, 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 the zip slow has been explained by saying, okay, there is a zip slow, I just sample this uh, zip slow, zip distribution, and I get an zip slow, okay? But typically, I mean, this is very, is very unusual. I mean, in normal systems, I mean, there is no sampling at all. I mean, you have a dynamical phenomenon, and of course, you should try to explain, I mean, Ips and Zips law consistently, I mean, on the same ground without making the hypothesis one being valid and the other one, I mean, deriving from the first one. And this is what, I mean, I'm going to, 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 to say later on. So one, uh, still one point about the, the, the empirical data. So the temporal patterns are very important here, okay? Uh, one point is about the notion of time, because uh, uh, there is a notion of intrinsic time, which is the, the definition I use so far, which says, okay, every time there is an event in the system, okay, I count one as time, okay. But of course, then there is a real time, the real time in which you, you count events in seconds, okay. And of course, I mean, in real time, I mean, the innovation rate could be much higher than what we saw so far, actually. And typically, actually, you see also exponential growth for the number of uh, events or also new events in a, in a system. If you look at this in the, in the real time, because I mean, what happens typically is the number of actors acting in the system can be increasing over time and also the number of events per unit time can be increasing. But looking at the, at the intrinsic time is, is, is very convenient because in this case, you're basically decoupling this from the number of agents Acting in the acting in the system, uh, so I mean one point is we want to distinguish between correlated and uncorrelated sequences. So in this picture, actually, uh, each bar is a, is an event, okay, and the two sequences are basically the same number of events, except that the the the, the sequence below is the actual one, okay, and the sequence upward is just a reshuffled sequence. So, so the same number of events, but just reshuffled in time. So, and if you look at the at the interarrival time for the for the upward uh, line, basically you have a Poisson process, okay, with the typical average time, okay, between two between two events, okay. But what happens in this uh, in this case? So, uh, these, for instance, are actual data for the Gutenberg corpus, okay, in which we measure the interarrival time. One interesting point about this is you see there is a, there is a fat tail distribution, okay. This is a log log plot, but even more interesting is if you reshuffle the distribution, I mean, in this case, you get basically the gray curve, which still, I mean, fat tail, so very, very close to the, to the original one. So one point is actually, if you see fat tails, okay, uh, I mean, you say that there is a clustering, okay, this is clear. But this doesn't mean that you have a triggering in the system. Okay, trigger means that uh, the occurrence of a given word is actually triggering more word, okay, of the same kind, okay. Or the occurrence of a given event, I mean, is triggering more event of the same kind afterward. So the reason why is this is because actually, if you start with uh, a fat tail distribution of events, okay, like we have for the zips distribution, then actually each word would have a specific frequency and each word would have a, an average interarrival time, okay, which would be one over the, the frequency of occurrence. But then actually if uh, F, so the frequency of occurrence is fat tailed, also one of F would be, would be fat tailed. So it's no, it's no surprise that actually that you get a fat tail distribution for this if you start with the distribution which is fat tailed. So in order to see whether you have triggering, which is uh, the, the important quantity I want to look at now, triggering means that, for instance, a novelty is actually increasing the probability for another novelty in the, in the next future, then I should look at something else. So one possible way to look at this is, uh, okay, let's consider this, uh, this, uh, this sequence, okay? And uh, this is a sequence of characters, and uh, the, each letter is basically denoting the, the, the label of a specific, a specific event. Okay, so all the A events are the same kind, the B events are the same kind, and so on and so forth. I suppose that in, in, all, in the old sequence, you have four occurrences of the label A. 
Okay. Now I want to know whether these label A are uniformly or Poisson-like distributed in the system or not. Okay. One specific measure is this one. So I basically divide the old sequence in the number of intervals, which is equal to the number of occurrences. So the number of occurrences in this case is four, okay? And I divide the old sequences in four in four events. And then I count for each interval, okay? Then the occurrences of A here, in this case is two, in this case is one, in this case is one, in this case is zero, okay? And based on this, I can actually compute this, uh, this uh, entropy which is basically the sum over all k. So k is uh, the number of uh, occurrences of, uh, of, of this character, okay? Uh, of what? Fi over k. So fi is the number of occurrences of the label A in the interval i, okay? A k is the number of occurrences of the label A in the all, in the all sequence, okay? Uh, of course, I mean, this quantity is given for a specific label. A, okay, and uh, and there is a maximal value which is log of k, so the lo the logarithm of the number of occurrences. So what I can do now, I, I can actually normalize this S A of k by the maximum value and see, I mean, what happens for a specific sequence or the reshuffled possible sequence. Okay, for instance, in this specific case, if I count this, I mean, the the the, normali the normalized value would be three quarter. Because of course, I mean, these numbers are more clustered than, than the random case, because you have two A's in the first, uh, in the first bin. Uh, and for instance, these are these data, okay, for, for text, for the Gutenberg corpus, okay. So on the X axis, you have K. So basically now you have different labels for the Gutenberg corpus is basically each label is a word. Okay, so you fix a word, you, you look at the frequency of this word, which, so the number of occurrences, which would be K. And for each word, actually, you count this entropy normalized. You see, the, for the actual data, the dots are the blue ones. And for the reshuffle case, the, the points are the green one. So you see, except for very high frequencies, I mean, all the dots in the real case have a, a normalized entropy, which is smaller. Than the, than the random one. So smaller means more ordered, okay, which means more clustered. But since we are looking at the, at the occurrences of these events in time, actually, this means also triggering, actually, because, I mean, the occurrence of a word is actually uh, somehow triggering the occurrence of other events of the same kind. So these kind of elements, actually, we looked at uh, to, to, to detect triggering in this kind of uh, novelty, novelty events. Um, and of course, we looked at many different, many different systems. Of course, I have no time to, 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 to tell you all this, but you can imagine that in all cases, actually, you can look at the zip slow, at the, at the, at the hip slow, at the, at the triggering effects. Actually, you can also look at the Taylor law and many other quantities, but okay, let's, let's stick to, to, to this one. Uh, now I would devote, I mean, what is remaining, I mean, to, to, uh, to, to, to a sort of mathematical framework, I mean, for, for these kind of events. It's a very long journey. It would be very interesting, I mean, to, to look at it in detail because it goes very, very uh, back in time, I mean, to, to, to Laplace, for instance, in this uh, succession rule, okay? Uh, but then, I mean, names are like, I mean, Johnson, Definetti, De Morgan. There is a very sophisticated mathematics behind this uh, innovation processes. Uh, I'll try to be very, very simple, I mean, uh, and go straight to the, to the points. Uh, but, uh, but just to tell you, I mean, there were a lot of early attempts and probably the, the, the key points are, okay, the Laplace rules of succession, the yule simon model and, uh, and the Polya and the Polya Hearns. Uh, the yule simon perhaps is the only one in which is innovation is present, even though actually in this case innovation is, is trivial because there is a constant trait of innovation. In polya hearns, normally, I mean, there is no innovation because the number of colors or number of type of balls in the hern is, is fixed at the outset. You just iterate the dynamics and look at the, at the asymptotic statistics of the extractions. Then there have been, I mean, urn schemes with innovation. So the most famous model is the Hop uh, model, which is very, very close to the, 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 Chinese, the Chinese restaurant process. Uh, of course, I mean, this, this process is uh, display uh, innovation and uh, also I would say the innovation rate decreasing over time, but in all these cases, the, 
the the the, the decrease i mean is too is too is too fast actually so if you if you if you think i mean the 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 ips law is not a power law but would be a logarithmic law so the the, the innovation the growth of novelties is too slow with respect to empirical to the empirical data and then i mean i, I will discuss a little bit this earnest incorporating this notion of adjacent possible actually i will mostly discuss i mean this last point uh, because otherwise this will take will take uh, will take forever but just i mean a little a little point about the the laplace rule for succession so the the, the question laplace was asking was okay given that i observed the sun rising each day for n consecutive days what is the probability of the sun rising the next day okay and and the simple and the simple solution for this was the formula you can see here below which is the prob the probability of looking at the sunrise tomorrow given that i saw the sunrise for n consecutive days is actually n plus one over n plus two so the probability is almost one and is increasing asymptotically towards sun if you increase the statistics which is basically the translation of the maximal ignorance about uh, about your system but still the innovation rate is non-zero it's not predicting at the sun will always rise okay and of course i mean uh, uh, there have been many 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 generalization of this uh, formula in the in the in the in the in the years to follow in the centuries to follow so uh, there are two interesting papers by Isabel i want to point out uh, uh, and in particular this uh, this paper of 92 predicting the unpredictable um, because really it's about all the attempts made by people in order to uh, make sense of the statistics of events that never occurred before. So how can you actually estimate the probability of an event that never occurred before? Okay, because you cannot look at the, at the statistics of the past. And what I mean, Isabelle is saying is actually this is not the problem of observing the impossible. So an event whose possibility we have considered, but whose probability we judge to be zero. Rather, the problem arises when we observe an event whose existence we did not even previously suspect. And so he calls this the unanticipated knowledge, which is somehow, I mean, the key point about novelties here. So here we, we come at the adjacent possible. So I told you already at the beginning, this was the idea of Stuart Kaufman and, uh, and somehow in his mind, the adjacent possible was, and actually is, uh, all those things, and of course, I mean, depending on the, the system you're considering, could be ideas, could be molecules, uh, could, be, could be technological products, okay? So components, somehow, like Lego bricks, that are one step away from what actually exists, from your actual, so what you experience already, and hence can actually arise from incremental modification or recombination of existing materials. Okay, so the idea is you have materials already there. Instead of making large leaps, you try to recombine and reuse the material already available, okay, uh, to, to create something, something new. But should be something adjacent, okay, should be possible, of course, but should be also close. I mean, of course, he says I'm one step away. It's not clear, I mean, what one step is, okay. Uh, in, in terms of time or in terms of effort. But still, I mean, there is this idea that something should be possible in the, in the near future. And uh, Stephen Johnson actually also added something about this definition saying that the strange and beautiful truth about the adjacent possible is that its boundaries grow as you explore those boundaries. So somehow the, the key point about the adjacent possible is you have a space, you are exploring this space, Okay, and perhaps I have an example here. Yes, okay. You have, uh, you have a space, you're exploring this space. So suppose now this is a space of friendship, okay? All the, all the white points are friends you met already, okay? You are the red, red, red guy. And you move, I mean, you, 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 you meet Surajit, and then you meet Satya, okay? And then at some point you meet Jan, okay? Who I met today for the first time. Okay. And what happens? So the idea is everything goes like after the, the, the encounter with Jan, a new part of the space would become possible, okay, it would appear to you, or okay, actually not would appear actually, because it could also be invisible, but still could be possible. Possible in the sense that now all Jan's friends, in principle, could be my friends at the next step. Because I don't know, after this lecture, I can actually exchange. Sorry, Jan, I mean, to, to involve you in this, but uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, in the in the in the next few days, we can get in touch and perhaps we organize another meeting with your friends. So, and this set of friends, I mean, which are now possible, um, can become actual if I move if I move forward. And of course, I mean, beyond there could be a certain number of people who are still possible, but still are not adjacently possible. Okay, I can probably meet them only after I met some other people in my adjacent posture. So somehow the key point, probably the only information to retain, I mean, from, from what I'm saying today in so many words, and sorry about this, is actually the idea of the adjacent possible is the conditional expansion of the space. So conditional to the occurrence of a novelty. Okay, so this is the key point because it's, it's one way, I'm not sure, I mean, this is the unique way, but it's one possible way in which you can explain why the innovation rates are what you observe empirically, okay? So, because if you put any other uh, sort of uh, um, innovation rate, which is not conditional to the, to the actual dynamics, you end up with something which is not, uh, which is not realistic. Uh, Vittorio, okay. we are about 15 minutes to go, roughly. I just okay, wanted to- very good. You know. very good, No hurry. If you are passionate for science fiction, you might remember Philip Dick and Ubik, okay? You remember in Ubik, they were the precogs, okay? And actually the precogs were people uh, for, for which the future actually was, uh, was laying down there as a certain number of cells, okay? And the brightness of these cells was different depending on the probability for these specific cells and this specific event to occur in the future. And of course, there was the anti-precog who was trying to scramble the, the brightness of this of these cells in order to scramble the prediction of the, the precog. So somehow the, the, the precog were sort of giving weights to the different cells in the adjacent possible for this, uh, for this kind of people. So somehow Philip Dick had already in mind something like this. And I guess uh, before, before Stuart Kaufman. Uh, okay, let, let me come up with, with a very simple model for, uh, for this. I guess you're all familiar with, uh, with the polya horns, okay? But if you focus only on the, on the left part of the screen, okay, you would have the definition of the typical polya horn with, uh, with many different colors. So you have the horn U, okay, at time T with a certain number of color. And what you do typically is you, you draw a ball from the, from the horn, in this case, the gray ball. And typically what you do, you put back the, the, the ball in the horn and crucially, you reinforce the ball. So you add to the, to the horn, so you reinforce the horn, sorry. You, you, you put back in the horn also raw copies of the same ball, okay? And this is the, this is the original polya horn, okay? Actually the original one was with two possible colors, but then the generalization was multiple colors. So you see, in this case, there is no innovation because the number of colors is given. You're only changing the statistics of colors in the horn and consequently the statistics of the colors appearing in the sequence. Okay, so the sequence is the actual history you are constructing by drawing balls from the, from the horn. Okay, now we are adding one ingredient, which is the ingredient of the adjacent possible. So and now we focus on the, on the right part of the table here. See, so suppose now at some point you draw the red ball Okay, the red ball have been something new for you. So in the sequence, it's the first time, okay, the red one appears in the, in the sequence. Okay, what you do is you put back to the red ball in the horn, you reinforce the red ball, like in this case, but then crucially, what you do is you add to the, to the horn, new plus one, then forget about the plus one, it's just for, 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 for sake of business in the, in the calculation, but a certain number of brand new colors. Okay, so this is the way in which new colors and if you wish and novelties are appearing in the system. But you see, this is conditional to the appearance of the red ball, which is a novelty at this very time for the system. So as simple as this. So at least this is probably the simplest way to put this conditional, this conditional appearance of novelties in, uh, in, in the system. So uh, there is also a formulation in terms of, uh, of uh, random walks on, uh, on graphs. Actually, you can map uh, almost one-to-one -one a system. So if you look now downward, suppose now, uh, actually you have a walker moving on a, on, a, on a graph. Okay, at some point, I mean, he, 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 he comes, I mean, on the, on the gray uh, dot, on the gray node, okay. 
And what it does actually is actually reinforcing the weight for this uh, for this node. And of course, I mean the dynamics is driven by the weight. So once I'm sitting in a specific node, I decide I mean to move in one of the enabling nodes with a probability which is normalized according to the weights of all the different nodes. So whenever I visit a node, I reinforce the weight of this of this node. But now suppose now I now on the right side on the panel, suppose now I, I, I come across this red uh, dot for the first time. So what happens is there is a new part of the of the network appearing. In this case, it could be a click, but could be any other any other sort of new uh, addition to the to the to the network. And of course, I mean you have this click. This is connected to the to the to the red node, but also with a given probability eta, you can actually connect the new nodes to the already existing nodes. Okay, of course there are many different ways. This is just one possible way. Uh, so of course, I mean the two models, the hard model and the, and the random works on graphs are almost identical. Almost because uh, if you wish, I mean the hard model will be the the annealed version. Of, uh, of the system, okay, because the probability can actually be reshuffled uh, every time. While I mean, on the on the on the random walk on graphs version, once the topology is there, you cannot actually change the topology. You can only change the the way. So you can still move around the probabilities, but the, you have a frozen accident which is given by the topology of uh, of the system. Um, we can actually derive the, the Ips law uh, in the continuum limit for, uh, for this system. And uh, the key point is actually writing the, the, the equation for dd over dt. So the derivative of the number of distinct uh, words or distinct colors in the system. And this is basically given by the ud of t, which is the number of elements in the herd that never appeared at time t in the in the sequence. Okay, so the number of distinct colors never extracted, divided by u of t, which is the number the total number of elements in uh, in t. Uh, you can actually compute. I mean, these two elements given the dynamics I I, I defined. So you start with n zero uh, colors in the in the herd. Uh, at each time step, basically, you extract the ball and you reinforce the ball. So if you look at the denominator, there is a term at the extreme right, which is rho t. Rho t simply because at each time step, you put back rho new balls, okay, reinforcing the already existing balls. And then there is this term, which is interesting, which is nu plus one times d, because every time you extract a new ball, you actually uh, put back in the her nu plus one new brand new colors okay and of course i mean you did this d times because did the number of distinct uh, colors okay and so you have this new plus one over d now what is the number of uh, uh, colors never extracted before okay it would be n0 plus uh, new d actually new plus one times d, but of course, since you just extracted, I mean, the, the, the ball one is not new anymore. And so you have new instead of uh, new plus one. So if you solve this, uh, this equation in the asymptotic limit, so in which t is much larger than n zero, you can, can do a certain number of approximation, or basically you end up with, uh, with the differential equation, which is quite straightforward, okay? I, I don't, I don't, waste your time, I mean, in solving this, but then, of course, I, I will put the, 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 the slides available and, of course, the papers if, you, if you're interested. Um, so you come up with, uh, with, uh, with this equation uh, circled in red here, which is basically linking D, which is the number of distinct colors appeared uh, as a function of T, okay? Rho, which is the reinforcement factor, nu, which is a novelty factor, a here is just a nu plus one, okay, is a convenient way to write nu plus one. Okay, now you can focus on different, uh, on different regimes. So there is a regime in which uh, the innovation is not so strong, so nu is smaller than rho, okay. So in this case, uh, uh, basically this d to the power rho of nu is basically uh, dominant with respect to the term ad, okay? And if you infer, basically you get a d is actually increasing like t over nu over rho. So which, since nu is smaller than rho, this is an exponent is smaller than one. So you have a sublinear growth, okay? So a power law with a sublinear growth and of course a prefactor. Uh, 
if the the innovation is too strong so strong enough so which means a new is larger than rho okay in this case this is the opposite because this part would be subdominant with respect to this part and actually you end up with a linear behavior so a linear growth so which means uh, a constant probability um, in constant innovation rate okay and then there is the the marginal case uh, which is rho equal to new and in this case basically you get a linear behavior with uh, with the logarithmic correction um, so if you, of course, you can actually uh, make the same calculation to estimate the exponents for the for the deep slow, and this is the is the summary. So if you have um, rho uh, larger than u, okay, so you have a sublinear growth for the deep slow, and the deep uh, slow, yes, and you have uh, again, I mean, a power law uh, for the deep slow. With an exponent which precisely one over the exponent of the Ips law. Okay, in the marginal case, you recover the Ips law as uh, as predicted by by Zips in the in the 40s at the end of the 40s with the almost linear growth for the number of novelties. So with the logarithmic correction, and it's interesting the case in which the innovation is strong enough because in this case you have a linear growth for the number of novelties and. Uh, again, a deep slow with an exponent which is uh, which is smaller than one. It's uh, incidentally, it's interesting to note that uh, this last case is uh, actually coincident with the case of the Yule Simon model, in which you have a constant probability for innovation in the system, provided that p is actually one minus rho over over nu, which is uh, which is smaller than one. Actually, this was uh, one of the ways in which people attempt attempted to explain the deep slow by using the yule simon model with a very uh, small p okay because in this case the exponent would be very very close to one at least actually one minus epsilon very very close to one okay so uh, so on the on the left basically you have the theoretical prediction for the innovation rate which is now the derivative of the 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 the, the, the Ips law okay and on the right i just put a few a few examples of this uh, innovation rate from several systems on Wikipedia, Twitter, GitHub, Last.fm. And you see, of course, the exponents are not universal, but you see that there is a tail with, uh, with, uh, with the power law with several exponents, which can actually be recovered by, I mean, if you're interested, by suitable combination of parameters for rho and nu in the, in the, in the original model. Uh, you can actually look at the, at the triggering effects also in this case. I told you already how to, to, to measure this, uh, but the point is what is triggering in this, uh, in this model. So in order to understand triggering, I need to un, uh, introduce semantics, okay? Because I want to know that this novelty, okay, is triggering a novelty of the same kind, okay? But I need to define, I mean, what kind the novelty is, okay? So one possible way to do, to do this is to actually associate uh, labels to, to colors, okay? Now, I mean, each color would have a label, like, I mean, the gray would have the label A, okay? And whenever I reinforce the, the gray ball, I mean, I, I put the same label A attached to this one, okay? And now when I introduce here on the right, I mean, new balls, also the new balls will have a label, but this label will be, will be brand new. So you see, at some point you would have colors, you have colors, you also, you have labels, okay? And, uh, and the simple modeling scheme is actually biasing the extraction, uh, the extraction of the of the colors with the labels. So basically, whenever you extract the label, okay, at the next time step, you are in real time. I mean, reassigning the probabilities and slightly reducing the probability of all the labels which are not in the in the in the same semantic domain of the, the balls just extracted, okay? So you are locally biasing the extraction. So it's no surprise that actually this is giving you what you, what you aimed for. But actually, if you now look at the same quantities as before, so this entropy to quantify the triggering effects, these are several cases. For instance, you have Wikipedia on the left, last FM, and the, and the model scheme is 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 on the right, and and the second row is actually the distribution of interarrival times. And you see the 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 actual curve, not reshuffled, is the is the red one, 
you see there is an overshoot for close for very short interarrival time, so close to one, two, so very small, very small interarrival times. Um, Surajit, I guess it will be five minutes more, right? Okay, okay. Uh, almost over, okay. I can stop anytime and just give you a couple of examples if possible, and then we open we open the discussion. So one interesting point is is to look at uh, at waves of novelties. okay. i I show you this empirical data. So if you focus, for instance, on okay, take any 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 point, like last FM, so bottom bottom left, okay. So what is on this graph is the following. So on the x-axis, there is time. So, which is divided into intervals. So, in the history of the system, you basically divide the history into chunks of time. Okay, and then for each chunk, you look at the most successful entity appearing in this uh, in this uh, in this interval. So, in this case, for last FM, this is a streaming a streaming system for music. Okay, so in this specific interval, you can actually look at the most popular song listened by all the all the users of this of the system okay and on the y axis what you plot is the arrival time so the appearance time in the system of the most successful song okay in the specific interval okay again so i take a specific interval i say i don't know beatles is the is the um, is the most famous song. Okay, Song of Beatles is the most famous song in this interval. So at uh, which time, I mean, which point in time this song was introduced? Okay, this will be T max of I on the Y axis. So now we, we, we can look at this. So suppose now that uh, the most successful song is always the, 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 the newest song in the system. So the newest hit. I just released a song and in this specific interval, this is becoming very, very successful then all the points should be on the diagonal, okay? If, I mean, the most successful song in this case will be Beethoven, okay? So a very old, a very old song. So something like, I mean, appeared at a very, very early stage, then all the points will be on the, on the X axis. You see the reality is in between, okay? So you have basically points covering the, the old triangle, which means that in the system, actually there is a coexistence between the 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 eats, so the, the the flames of popularity for for new songs but also the popularity for evergreens okay and i guess this is due to the to the attitudes of people uh so the listening attitudes in this case or also other attitudes for for, for different systems to to either exploit or explore where exploits will be basically retracing the steps you, you had already in the past or exploring will be, I mean, discovering something, something totally new. And actually, if you look closely, actually, you realize that, uh, that uh, you can actually measure uh, the EPS exponent for each individual. So how much each individual is actually uh, innovating, innovating in the sense of experiencing something new. And there is a wide distribution of exponents for different individuals. So there are individuals which are really explorers, okay, really, I mean, go for novelties most of the time, and then very conservative people trying to, to, to retrace the, the old steps every time. And in the specific case of Last FM, actually, listening always to the same, to the same set of songs. Um, Actually, you can you can slightly modify I mean, the original model, and now what you what you do in this case is you basically define uh, divide all the possible elements in uh, in in two classes first. I mean, so what appeared already, okay, and what didn't appear so far, okay, and at each time step, I can subdivide these two classes into two subclasses, which are okay what appeared in the same semantic domain of what just happened or not in the same semantic domain. And the same for what didn't appear so far. So is in the same semantic domain or not, okay? And actually, if you, if you run this, I mean, I don't go into the details of the, of the model, but you can actually see the last line here is what you get at the modeling scheme. So you are actually able to reproduce the the this sort of uh, waves so we call this waves of novelties because actually you have basically waves of uh, um, exploiting something old or exploring something something new 
And again, I mean, the, the attitude is, uh, is this one. So either retracing old steps or creation of new, of new paths, which, I mean, if you think carefully, is something which is in, in industrial uh, uh, environments is always there, right? Okay, because people are always thinking about, I mean, okay, I, I do it better, I did a bit, I mean, my product, I do it a little bit better, or I try to innovate and creating something totally, totally new, okay? And so, of course, I mean, the, the, the boundary between these two uh, elements is not so easy to, to, to draw, but still, okay, the attitudes could be, could be very different. In all these systems, it seems that there is a very subtle interplay between these two attitudes, which make the system somehow stable, okay? So able to accept novelties, but still able to, to, to give value to, to, to evergreens. Uh, okay, there is another example which uh, which I might keep, but perhaps I mean it's better to to leave time for for the discussion. I just get to the to the conclusions uh, with with a few open questions. Which uh, okay, I organize these questions in three set of questions. So the the first point is uh, so we discussed a lot about this adjacent possible and so at this space. I sort of figure out this space in terms of either polya horns or, or graphs, okay? But of course, I mean, this is just two, two possible uh, formalization or simplification, I would say, of this. So in general, we don't know what is the topology of this adjacent possible. So the structure, the evolution, I mean, if you have dynamics on it, of course. Uh, of course, we, we can look at the data and, and try to, to, to look at the data, trying to reconstruct something, okay? Um, and of course, I mean, if you if you have I mean sort of longitudinal data sets in which you have time, okay, you can stop at a certain point in time and try to predict what could be the adjacent possible in terms of what would be connected to the dots in which I'm sitting right now. Of course, this is still uh, not able to capture the full complexity of the adjacent possible because, as I said, this would be uncomputable. But still, you can have a, a clear idea. So I guess this uh, this uh, this uh, research line of charting, I mean, this space, it's a, it's a very interesting one. I mean, the kind of spaces could be conceptual spaces, could be any kind of space, also also fuzzy. Uh, but I guess I mean, this is really at the beginning of the of the exploration. Then I mean, one of the question is how do people explore this uh, adjacent possible? And there are many sub questions like individuals versus collective behaviors. The early adoption versus large scale spreadings, the, the, the multiples, so in the competition of several innovation. Exaptation is a very interesting one. Okay, it's coming from, from biology and this point in which I mean something originally uh, born for, for a specific function, a specific purpose, then at some point, I mean, gets recruited for a completely different, uh, different function. Uh, recommender system is a very active domain of research because, of course, I mean, you, you may want to, to steer the attention of people in this sort of space of possibilities. What we realized recently, and this is, is now very well known, is uh, recommender systems, for instance, in the area of, of information are basically at the source of the eco chambers. Because typically, I mean, present day recommender systems are actually recommending you something that you liked already in the past, okay, or that someone who has similar behavior as you, I mean, liked in the past, but in this way are basically confirming your bias, okay, and sort of suggesting you think about Netflix, so just suggesting you movies that you liked already, or the kind of movies you already liked in the past. So what we are thinking right now is a, is a sort of a new generation of recommender systems pushing you somehow uh, out of your comfort <coughs> zone. Each of us has a comfort zone, so something we are comfortable with, okay? And the idea is to dislodge you a little bit from this comfort zone and try to, I mean, force you to experience something you wouldn't experience naturally, but still can be acceptable for you. And of course, this comfort zone strongly depends on the individual, okay? It's not something you can do once and for all for, for, for everyone. And this will be interesting also in the information, in the, in the infosphere, so in the, in the information ecosystem. <coughs> To allow people to be more open-minded, so to see more also outside of their uh, eco chamber, and of course, I mean there are all the, the the set of questions concerning to designing the best environments and the best strategies for innovation at the individual level, but also at the at the collective level. 
So for instance, I have a very, a very good friend of mine once has told me, okay, you know, you know, people, individual people can be, can be very creative, okay? But uh, can you make institutions creative? So an institution with thousand people, I mean, innovating, I mean, at the, at the fast pace. And this is, I guess, is a very, it's a very big challenge. I mean, if you look also at our institutions. So there is a last set of questions concerning what, what machine do. Okay, because of course also machines are exploring, I mean, now more and more the, the adjacent possible. And, uh, and uh, I would say, I mean, present machines, even the most powerful ones, have a very, very hard time, I mean, dealing with novelties. They can actually generalize a bit, so try to come up with something that was not present in their training set, but still not something with statistics totally off with respect to the, to the training set. So the, the idea of go, moving towards something like a dynamical segmentation in which you try to generalize and try to figure out what could be also in terms of novelties is still an open an open field and, and of course this will change the way in which uh, in which ai will set the the, the, the interplay between exploit and uh, and explore and of course i mean there is a general question about modeling and inference you, i guess i mean we are more or less on the same side on this so more on the side of uh, of modeling, but uh, you, you know very well that there are trends now saying that with data and inference and machine learning, you can actually get rid of theory. Okay, and of course, I mean this is is wrong in many different many different ways. But still, I mean the way in which we can uh, have an interplay between inference and modeling is very interesting because one of the interesting way in which you can use inference is to try to infer the parameters of your modeling scheme. Yes, we have a sort of feedback loop between, I mean, your ideas about the modeling scheme, but also data coming from experience in order to, to improve not only data driven, okay, but also the, the kind of structure of, of, your, of your modeling scheme. So I would probably stop here, uh, not before thanking, I mean, my, my, my collaborators, there are many more I marked here in uh, in, uh, in light blue, Vito Cervedio, Steven Strogatz, and Francesca Tria, with whom we published the, the first paper back in 2014. We had a very, very nice time at, uh, at uh, I guess it was in 2012 or 13, in Rome also with Steven Strogatz, in which we conceived all this. And then, of course, this uh, somehow enlarged as a, as a bubble afterwards. So thanks a lot again for the invitation and your attention. Thanks. Thank you. That was a very refreshing a nice and interesting and different talk. So let's Thank open up for questions. I guess we are already late, right? It's, it's, it's 12 something, right? For That's you. okay, we can have some questions. I'm, I'm really sorry, I mean, I took too much time. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's like I said, it's very informal. People who are hanging out here are hanging out because they're interested, so. <laughs> okay. So, um, I I, I've got a question, if I may. Thank yeah, you very much for the nice talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so, when you talk about the adjacent possible, could you please comment on the potential role of critical phase transitions in this in this dynamics? Uh, with that, with that, do you think that would be relevant to think about at all? Uh, no, I've been thinking about this for a while, but uh, I, I, I couldn't figure out, I mean, the, a way to, to, to track this, actually. Uh, I don't have, I don't have a, an answer, I mean, for this, actually, because uh, I guess one should focus on a specific system and see in which way, I mean, you can have novelties and still keep the phase transition, right? Okay, right. Because, right. Because the point is that whenever you have a phase transition, you have, you have a system in which the phase space is more or less given. Okay, perhaps you don't know all the details about the phase space, but you know, I mean, this cannot grow over time, right? While the point here, suppose now you have a system in which the, either the number of possible states is increasing, okay, or the possible rules in the, in the systems are increasing, and uh, you still may want a phase transition for this system. Okay, so I don't have an answer, but uh, it's uh, it's very challenging. I mean, one one strand of research we are pushing now is trying to extend information theory to these kind of systems. 
because of course, I mean, if you, if you try to measure entropy in these entropic measures in, in these systems, uh, at some point you, you get into troubles because since uh, the phase space is, is enlarging, you don't know how to normalize what is the correct normalization for this. Of course, you have an entropy rate, you have to, 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 to keep this in mind. Uh, but I never, I never stumbled uh, upon a system with novelties like this one, so in which the phase space is increasing and, and the phase transition. But uh, it's fun. It would be, it would be interesting to, to, to look at it. Yeah, that, thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So I will Thank you very I much for nice stop talk. sharing. So that I can okay. I can okay. see okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Good. So so th th thanks thanks a lot for the nice talk. So I just had a question because you know I mean when we are mentioning about the Heap's law in your model, where you have uh, linear growth for rho bigger than nu, I guess. And then uh, you know n to the power some power, and then n by log n exactly at the marginal critical on marginal yes. point. So this reminded me somehow to the classical result, right? Which is if you just take a ordinary random walk in d dimensions, okay, and you ask you know the mean number of distinct sites visited by the random walk in time t, and there the you know the result is a very classical result which goes like t to the power d by two for d less than two. And mm -hmm. exactly t over log t in d equal to two, and then linear t for d bigger than two. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I I I wonder if you know there is a there is a you know some kind of connection to that or that's one question, and then I would sort of uh, I'd be curious to know that you know what would the Jeep's law would mean in that context in terms of just a uh, random walk on a d-dimensional lattice because I guess there must be connection. Uh, you know, this f of r, what does that mean in the context of uh, random walk? Uh, okay. Uh, I, okay. I wonder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the first question is, is very interesting. Actually, um, uh, long before, I mean, this paper about the adjacent postural. So we, we, we try yeah. to explain the, 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 the Eeps law with, with the random walk approach. Okay. Uh -huh. And, and right. the only way in which we could actually figure out to explain why the exponent was uh, were smaller than one was to imagine yes. that you have a network, okay, and you start, I mean, many different random walks always from the same point, mm -hmm. okay, with yeah. a certain distribution of length, okay, and then you right. count the number of distinct uh, points in the network yeah. touch. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is connected somehow to the adjacent possible because somehow you are touching every time the boundaries. And with fluctuations, right. you are pushing the boundaries of what you touch I and mean, farther away a little bit. Of course, right. now if you if you scramble this and you say, okay, now the starting point can be everywhere, okay, yes. in the in the graph, then you recover what the results you just said in terms of the, right. the exponents. So I, I guess uh, I mean there must be some yeah there must be some you know this because that transition occurs the main reason is because of the recurrence versus transient property of random walk in d equal to two d less than two it's uh, it's a recurrent and d bigger than two it's transient yes, I wonder if yes. there's a sort of similar recurrence uh, versus you know the, the transient behavior in in this Heap's law in your model I mean maybe not I don't know I'm just just curious to know I mean so. Uh... I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer now, but I guess it would be interesting to explore. Yeah. Yes, sure. I never thought about this. And as for the as for the deep slow, I would say in this case would be just I mean the the distribution of uh, number of visits in the in the, yes in a given site basically. I see. Mm -hmm. It would be just statistic. Yes, but probably this could be a way to 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 relate uh, the recurrence times, right? Because yeah, again, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, probably. I mean. Uh... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that would be probably a starting point to look at this. Okay. Okay. Perhaps in in Thank one you. of our meeting yes. in Paris, I mean, this could be. <laughs> yes. This could be sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. One of the thoughts I had, uh, uh, Victorio, is that uh, Cian Yang, uh, in his in his sixtieth. Uh, Anniversary celebrations. There was a volume published, mm -hmm. and I remember he wrote a he wrote a, a blurb in that volume, and and the point of the point of the blurb was that uh, our taste, our taste in what we do, has a big role to play in what we do, uh, mm. and and he went on to point out that 
you know, as scientists, we don't really normally think about our taste or our inclinations or our um, intuition and what have you, but that has an enormous role in the evolution of science itself. I, I found that very intriguing actually. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it has stuck with me for the last, uh, God knows how many years, almost uh, 37, 38 years, ever since I came across this line. And I wonder, you know, uh, I wonder what do you, how, how do you, you know, or if you can take that into account, because it, it would seem to me that taste is indeed very important. We do what we do because there are certain things that we like, that there are certain things that our brains propel us perhaps to, to, uh, to investigate, right? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that if, if you take this whole point, the issue of where we go next uh, depends to some degree on our trajectory and our history. And there's lately been a lot of work on, on evolutionary anthropology, which literally is looking into history mathematically. Uh, and Peter Turchin is one person Oh yes, I know. Uh, who has who has done a lot of work, as you may know, from University of Connecticut. Um, so I was is just wondering. Pardon me. Is it now in Vienna too at the Complexity Science Hub? Oh, I Peter. see. I didn't know that. Oh, oh, that's yes. interesting. Yeah, I was trying to get him. Yes. Yeah, he, he does fascinating work. I I ran into his work recently, yes. and you know, so so I was just curious as to whether one can actually learn from this in the whole game of uh, breaking down echo chambers in, in, in the in the whole game of uh, uh, making interactions more fruitful and whether whether uh, machines and, and and scientific analyses has a role to play in it I guess, uh, uh, no, this is, fa this is fascinating. And uh, I guess we have a little bit of this in the modeling scheme uh, when we, we, we try to insert semantics. Of course, we are discussing mm -hmm. about semantics, right? I mean, so we give a specific meaning to a specific spot in the, in, the, in the adjacent possible. Of course, I mean, the meaning for a spot can be different for me, for you, and for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we put a bias, OK, uh, in terms of uh, the, the the labels, okay, we are already pushing a little bit, so biasing the the movement towards a semantic. But of course, I mean, this is just uh, the modeling scheme is not based on on actual choices. So what could be interesting would be looking at the actual history of people, okay, and try to extract features in terms of what they like. This is what actually recommender systems do. An important point about this is, uh, so, so far we discussed the adjacent possible as a, as a sort of a unique body, okay? And of course, each of us has a different adjacent possible, right? I mean, what is adjacent for me today? I mean, it's not for you, okay? But of course, I mean, when every time we interact, okay, somehow we are sort of making our adjacent possible closer, okay? Mm -hmm. And overlapping a little bit, okay? That's why we find, I mean, common common interest, right? Or of course, we can have a spark for, for, for a new paper. So you see, I mean, there is not only, I mean, my taste, but also the interactions with, with other people. So for instance, so one, of, one of the last, uh, last thing we did was uh, try to explain the, the origin and evolution of social networks, okay? In terms of, okay, I'm interacting with you, okay? But since I interact with you, I learned that you have uh, a few contacts which uh, I can actually come in contact with in the next future, okay? And there is a certain chance to do this. So somehow there is the co-evolution of uh, the, 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 my experience and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all the, the structure of the, of the adjacent possible. Um, I guess, I mean, there are, there are two, two main lines here. One is learning from, uh, from, uh, from data. And of course, it's, it's not easy because data are typically uh, gives yeah. you a sort of indirect, I mean, uh, picture of, of the taste, right? I mean, what I, what I do is not precisely what I like, okay? Of course, I mean, it's connected, but not precisely. So this is one point. And the, and the, and the other point would be, of course, I mean, involving also social scientists into, into this. 
but yes, this is an open problem. So because uh, we can inject a little bit of semantics there, but I would say this is totally still open and uh, a little bit, I mean, can be done, I mean, on the, on the side of the recommender systems and this sort of creative recommender system in which I try to push you in a direction which is novel. Okay, for you, but still, I mean, across all the possible novel directions, the actual way in which you bias this is not completely obvious, right? Yeah, yeah, that, no, that, 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 that's it. Yeah, I've been fascinated by this question. There's a question here from uh, Hema. Hema, I think, has, yeah, I couldn't switch uh, out. has a bit of a problem with his microphone, maybe. Uh, yeah. He has trouble getting in. Uh, so he says, anything that is computable has no novelty. The world uh, based on physics then would have no novelty. Where does novelty come then? Is it subjective comments? Please. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, one point is uh, um, I typically distinguish between novelty and innovation, saying that novelty is a personal experience and innovation is something which is uh, potentially universal for, for everyone. Um, I mean, if you if we think that the, the physics is a good representation of of our reality, of course, I mean in the in the formalization we give we give so far, then I would say probably would be novelty could be only subjective in the sense that uh, we as scientists we discover something which is already there we don't know, okay, but somehow I mean at the at the upper level of abstraction, there will be a God or I mean a super agent who knows already, I mean, the structure of the adjacent possible. Um, but, uh, and of course, I mean, here we are discussing about nature, but uh, the, the point is I'm not sure that the, the rules of the game are not changing over time. Uh, Physics and in general science is changing over time and the kind of formalization, I mean, is changing over time. So also the framework in which we move, I mean, can be, can be new. Whether nature uh, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, novelty in, in terms of something that was not uh, even conceivable from the outset, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I mean all the the animals and and and, uh, and the forms of life are based on the on the, the the elements we know right so a different combination of these elements uh, I don't know it's probably we are probably pushing toward the philosophical question <laughs> yeah it's a role of jumps right I mean uh, one of the things that we uh, we become uh, good at I suppose. Uh, as mm. we experience things is we can make we can make jumps in our thinking and jumps in our thinking again goes back to the issue of taste goes back to the issue of intuition goes back to the issue of yes. uh, even ability to have uh, time to think uh, and clear thinking because one of the things that i think modern society often doesn't give us is, is time to think and uh, i i don't know about you guys but i guess everybody is pretty much the same uh, I have to run away uh, to, to think. Uh, usually I would disappear for a walk uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and they turn out to be uh, among the most interesting experiences I, I have. I, in fact, I forget where I'm going most of the time. But, but <laughs> it's a fascinating problem because that's my time to make jumps. And, 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 and the other thing that I also wanted to bring out is you, is you talked about viruses, right? And, and the issue about viruses is very interesting because viruses don't have a brain. So in, in, in principle, combinatorically challenging as it may be, the evolution of a virus is always predictable, uh, excepting that you don't know which one's gonna show up, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in some sense, viruses are definitely more more tractable that way than, than bacteria are because bacteria, I don't know if they have a brain as such, but they're evolutionarily more advanced, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then it's, it's a matter of, uh, so there is a distinction between the origin. So the fact that you keep sampling new, 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 new DNAs for, for viruses 
it was actually appears. I mean, you basically experience. And this is a matter of diffusion, as we as we well know now, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's always a competition between the, the the pathogen and the host in this situation, mm -hmm. and then very complex. So it's uh, somehow it's a mixed dynamic between. I mean, what could be appearing, what could be possible, and what actually will become patent somehow right. at the at the, at the population. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. Amazing. Any further questions? I don't want to tie Victoria down for the whole afternoon uh, or his evening. Uh, it's okay. Of course. I mean, if you have questions later on or curiosities, just I mean, send me a message. and I'll be pleased to keep interacting. But thanks again for your attention. Thank you. Oh, last question from Sunny: Is novelty yes. always novelty to the novelty? <laughs> I like that question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, three times the words novelty in the same question is <laughs> novelty always novelty to the novelty. I don't know, it depends on the definition because uh, um, uh, I don't know it's, what I whether I mean this was, is what uh, I mean. What yeah, I go ahead, yeah, novelty to me now, maybe this novelty could be novelty to be a newborn in the next 10 years or five years. So, so, sorry, I couldn't. No, I, I couldn't get you because at some point it was cut. Can you can you repeat? See, for example, one novelty to me is novelty today, and this novelty could be novelty to the newborn in ten years. Yes. Yeah, this is this is true. Yeah, yeah, this is true. But I mean, if you think in terms of novelty as a, as a personal experience, of course, I mean. Uh, the novelty can be novel by definition for many different people in many different times, okay, because it's just the somehow the experience of this novelty, but not the actual creation of this novelty. But it's also true that uh, is uh, here to define a sort of uh, semantic boundary, because, for instance, if I only if I only listen to 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 classical music, okay. Uh, then, of course, I and I say classical music is it's one bubble, okay. I'm not experiencing novelties, even though actually I keep listening many different uh, pieces of, of, of music. So it depends on what is your category of novelty, which is a, a single object or the categories in which uh, these objects are, are embedded. And depending on this, of course, you can have a different, uh, a different definition of novelty. But as you can imagine, all these definitions are, are very um, sort of, I mean, based on quicksand, right? There is no yes. clear cut definition of what novelty or innovation is. No equilibrium level here. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yes. Thank you so much. No, thank, you, you. thank you, all of you who joined and, and are still hanging out. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, late morning here, afternoon. Now. And have a great weekend. And we'll, we'll yes. be in touch. And, with, and you can always feel free to communicate with Vittorio uh, if you. Yes. But Send me send me the links also for the for the next editions. I'll be I'll yes. Be I put to... you on the I put you on my mailing list, which is which is quite large. But yeah, you'll get an annoying emails from me. There are some coming up. <laughs> Actually, Satya is coming up in the end of May. Okay, perfect, perfect. May, Look forward. May twenty ninth, I think. But I, yeah, I'll I'll let you know. Okay, very good. Right. Bye guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a lot, you. everyone. Have a nice day. Bye Thank bye. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.